This is the Tar River in Tipperary. It is a natural, undisturbed river and supports a whole ecological system. It's home to a wide variety of fish, birds and insects. You can see how it curves and meanders, shallowing and deepening at various points, all of which is essential for its inhabitants. Over the last 50 years, the Irish landscape has undergone considerable change. Some Irish rivers have been modified in order to protect the land and population from flooding and to benefit agriculture. This process is called arterial drainage and historically was a widespread practice. The arterially drained channels have been artificially widened and deepened and as a result have lost many of their natural physical features. The restoration of some of these basic features increases the physical diversity of the channels and this creates more niches and habitats for a wider variety of wildlife to thrive in these rivers once again. In carrying out any restoration works, it is important to retain the drainage or flood relief capacity of the channels. It is also important to select features that are appropriate to the channel and location in question. It is not a case of one shoe fits all. Enhancing rivers to recreate these natural features is a complex and ongoing process. In some cases, the best approach is to leave the river alone and let the river re-naturalize over time. But in other cases, the river needs a helping hand to restore these natural features. All restoration work should be carried out by an experienced team in conjunction with landowners, the OPW and Inland Fisheries Ireland. This is a long-term environmental program of river enhancement that aims to maximize the wildlife quality of the river. This short video details the reconstruction of some of these natural features, demonstrating how and why they work, along with how to measure and monitor their success once completed. Natural undisturbed rivers have a variety of flow throughout. This provides diversity in the environment to suit the needs of all wildlife within from salmon and trout to lamprey and other fish species along with the birds, plants, invertebrates and mammals. Ultimately, most of the features outlined in this film centre around managing and varying the flow of a river. Alternating deflectors and random boulders help to create and maintain a thalawag, thus concentrating the river's flow. Salmon, trout and lamprey need shallow gravelly stretches in which to spawn which can often be lost in drained rivers. Creating riffle points shallows the water in areas to create spawning grounds. And finally, enhancing and strengthening the banks of the river with fencing and bank stabilization will help to protect the river from any further erosion and pollution. In historically drained rivers, most pool areas are lost as are the associated gravel spawning areas, usually located at the tail of a pool. You would expect there to be pools in this channel on average at 50 meter intervals. None are present here over the 250 meter length channel that you can see. In high gradient channels, weirs can be used to reinstate pool areas. Weirs are structures which temporarily impede flows and concentrate the downstream discharge into the central areas creating scour in an excavated pool downstream. They accommodate the presence of a gravel shoal at the tail of this pool. The key to the long-term stability of weirs is to build whatever type of weir you require on a foundation of large rocks buried beneath the weir as illustrated in this plan view. Let's look at the process of building a weir on the River Dee in County Louth. At this point, the foundation stones for the weir have been trenched into the bed across the river. The top of the boulders are flush with the river bed. A triangulated bed of stone has been built next to the left bank and is being secured into position. The raised, triangulated level of stone is now in place next to the right bank. The concentration of flow towards the centre of the channel flow is already evident. Now a single jockey stone is moved into position and left sitting on top of the foundation stones in the center of the weir. The increase in velocity over the weir because of the jockey stone in place is obvious.
Now that the weir structure is complete, the machine starts to excavate the pool area downstream. The bed here is composed of packed gravels. These are decompacted by the machine and used to construct a spawning gravel shoal at the tail of the pool. Once the pool is excavated, the machine carefully places three large boulders in the pool in a triangulated arrangement. Now, some eight years later, the weir and pool area are clearly functional. Bankside vegetation is recovered thanks to the fencing program. The loosened gravels which were deposited by the machine at the tail of the pool have now been partially colonised by aquatic plants. Salmon and trout have spawned here every year since the weir, pool and gravel was constructed some eight years ago. Vortex stone weirs can vary in design and yet perform the same function. Basically, they all concentrate flows to a central channel area which maintains a good flow of highly oxygenated water through the gravels of spawning shoal areas. This makes it a better environment for fish eggs. Paired stone deflectors essentially function as a type of stone weir but constrict flows through a central channel area. In contrast to vortex weirs, paired deflectors are used in low gradient, low energy channels. In construction terms, they differ from other weirs by having no subfloor requirement across the whole channel width. The larger stones, along the outer edge of each frame, need to be trenched into the bed to ensure the long-term stability of the structure. The height of these structures, like all of the other weir structures, should be just above summer water level so they do not impede flood flows. This paired deflector and associated pool in early spring had only been built the previous autumn. The fine silt that has been deposited on the stone frames in just one winter is already starting to vegetate. Paired deflectors can be constructed in any size of channel. They're particularly useful if minimal impedance to flow is required to prevent flooding. In larger channels, like the river robe here, heavier materials are required to ensure that the long-term stability to the structure can be guaranteed. This sequence of shots taken in the river robe, County Mayo, shows the step-by-step -step procedure involved. The frame of the deflector next to the left bank is under construction here. The largest stones available are used to construct the outer frame of the deflector. The frame next to the left bank has now been filled and is being levelled off. The paired deflector here in the foreground has been completed. A pool has been excavated downstream and a substantial gravel shoal has been created using imported gravels and placed at the tail of this pool. Trout have spawned here every year since this shoal has been introduced. Farm stock have been fenced out once in-stream works were complete. Eight years after the farm stock have been excluded, nature has taken over and completed the task which was commenced by the machine driver. The paired deflector has vegetated over and is functioning perfectly. The increased scour has maintained the deep pool area downstream and the gravel shoal is still in place and being used by trout for spawning purposes. All natural undisturbed meandering channels will feature a thalwig. A thalwig is essentially a deep line of flow, illustrated here in blue, which meanders over and back across the channel as we move downstream. It breaks down temporarily at riffle points, reforming again as the channel enters its next meander bend. It is an ever-present natural feature of all undisturbed channels and should always be recreated when removed. A thalwig cannot be seen clearly in natural rivers except in extreme drought conditions when the internal flow will only be sufficient to fill the thalwig. It will usually be one-third of the base width of the channel. In contrast, 
In tidal regions, the thalweg can be seen on a daily basis during low tide. In drained rivers, like this section of the D, the river is flat in cross section and the river is unable to scour out a thalweg, even on meander bends like this one. Restoration of a thalweg should be regarded as an essential part of any enhancement programme carried out. Here, at the Black River in County Galway, a machine is excavating a thalweg close and parallel to the left bank as the machine proceeds downstream. The thalweg excavated here through this long meander bend eight years ago has remained functional. You can see the bubble line on the water, which is concentrated towards the left bank right through the meander bend. The bubble line is always concentrated over and through the thalweg. In this stream, partially encased in concrete, the channel was artificially twice too wide. The use of paired and alternating deflectors have restored a natural channel base width and produced pools. Additional gravel placed on the bed have also provided trout spawning opportunities. Prior to work, this section of the river was virtually fishless. Alternating deflectors can be used to create channel sinuosity. Alternating deflectors are simply one half of the paired deflector structure which you have already seen. They are built on alternate banks as the river moves downstream to create a sinuous flow through a flat broad channel with a uniform current. The frequency at which deflectors are built along a channel will be dictated by the channel gradient or slope. The higher the gradient in the channel reach, the further apart the deflectors can be from one another. They should be built upstream in a series of structures. You can see from the deflective flows where the next structure should be constructed. The resulting meandering line of flow is illustrated here by the sinuous clear water channel between these three deflectors. In very flat channel sections, like this reach of the Black River in East Galway, it may be necessary to overlap these structures in order to generate increased flows. When filling the frames of the deflectors, the machine has scraped off some semi-aquatic grass from the bank and placed these clods of vegetated earth in patches on the internal surface of the deflectors frame. This earth should root and accelerate the regeneration process of the deflector frames which provides further stability. There is a whole range of aquatic mosses and plants which only grow on silt-free stone beds. A deflector series will ensure that these conditions will be available in at least a part of the river. In drought conditions, particularly in spate rivers, the deflectors will concentrate most of the flow into a narrow scour channel, ensuring an area of adequate depth and flow to accommodate fish populations until normal flow recovers. Boulders and gravel play important roles in fish re-enhancement programs. Boulders are obviously crucial in constructing weirs and deflectors. In many drained channels, there are lengthy shallow glide sections with a uniform smooth bed. These river reaches support poorer salmon and trout numbers, as they have limited diversity of fish food items and they also lack the type of habitat ideally suited to juvenile salmon and adult trout. The young salmon prefer fast-flowing, shallowy reaches with a stony bed, whilst larger trout like deep pool areas. The construction of rubble mats with associated pools can restore the natural morphology and ecology of such areas. These drawings illustrate the key features involved. Firstly, a bed or mat of broken quarried stone is placed on the riverbed from bank to bank. The stones should always be below the summer water level. This mat should be slightly dished centrally to create a scour effect to the pool area which is excavated downstream of the rubble mat. Stones used in the mat would usually be 20 to 30 centimetres in diameter to ensure they are not washed out. A number of boulders should be placed in the pool area downstream 
to create a higher quality habitat for trout. Shortly after hatching, young salmon and trout seek refuge from high flows by congregating around boulders. A large number of invertebrates will also use the hard surface of the boulder as a safe, secure surface. These stones were only placed in the river three weeks before this shot was taken. The invertebrates here, mostly snails, have already colonised the stones and are grazing on microscopic algae which themselves are living on the stones. Over time, the initial algae colonisation is often replaced by colonies of aquatic mosses as seen here. An even more complex community of invertebrates can live in the moss, including many large grubs. Fish are not the only beneficiaries. In uniformly shallow gravel bed channels, individual randomly placed boulders used in combination with deflectors can create a much more complex river in fluvial terms, which suits the fish. You can clearly see here the extent to which individual boulders deflect flows. There are two important features with these boulders. Firstly, they have been placed within the central third of the channel. Boulders placed close to either bank could deflect flows to the bank and cause erosion problems. And secondly, these stones need to be 1 to 1.5 tonnes in weight in spate rivers to ensure their stability in flood flows. The largest rocks available should be used and partially buried to ensure that the deflection of flow that's from them is not too severe. This large rock has scoured out a significant channel in the gravel bed region providing a habitat for fish. Each individual boulder or cluster of stones will have a different scouring impact which will depend on the shape of rock and the bed material. These scoured areas are effectively pocket pools which provide resting places for smaller fish. They also ensure that even in drought conditions there will be sufficient deep areas to accommodate all the fish. In many Irish rivers that are subject to flash floods, gravel sizes in the beds are often too large. Because of the high energy level, this size of gravel is only suited to salmon for spawning purposes. In such river systems, most trout spawn in tributaries where gravel sizes are smaller. Boulders in the main stem channels can sometimes scour out small pools and deposit patches of smaller sized gravels locally, like this one. Because of these boulders, trout have been spawning in these areas. Here, in the Abbey River in Donegal, a pear deflector and gravel pool section has just been constructed. Research has shown that the placement of three boulders in a triangulated fashion helps to maintain scour. The arrangement you can see here is ideal. A single stone placed centrally in the neck of the pool and two additional stones downstream in the central pool area, one toward the left and the other toward the right bank. Essentially in flood flows, the stone in the neck area splits the flow, sending half towards each of the two stones further downstream. They in turn divide flows again by maintaining a scour pattern through the pool. Gravels are small round stones found in most Irish rivers. They tend to accumulate in mounds, downstream of pool areas and meander bends. Generally speaking, gravel shoals are roughly 30 centimetres or so in depth. Reintroduced gravels in drained rivers should also have a depth of 30 centimetres. The surface of this gravel bed should be just beneath the summer water level. If necessary, dig out the bed to create room for the new gravel bed. Here's an example of gravel placement at the tail of a weir pool from the Morning Star in County Limerick. All salmon and trout lay their eggs in gravel deposits known as reds. These large trout have left Loch Arrow, moving downstream in the Unshan River to spawn. Male fish become very aggressive at this time. The male here has been badly bitten on his gill cover by a competitor. This large, battle-scarred male is guarding a female who has just started to dig her red. The female will continue to dig until she is satisfied that the red, or nest, is deep enough. At this stage the male will always be close by. Spawning follows and the female sheds her eggs with the male releasing his sperm at the same time. Once the eggs are shed, the male's part is over and the female is left to cover the eggs with gravel which completes the spawning ritual. Not all eggs will be secured within the reds. 
the loose eggs on top of the gravel bed will provide a food supply for small fish, invertebrates and birds. As there is a very small survival rate of eggs that reach adulthood, a female trout will lay around 1200 eggs per kilo weight of her body. This will ensure the survival of the fish stock. All of the spawning shots you've seen here were on introduced gravel beds. A machine driver will often encounter a compacted gravel bed during a drainage maintenance excavation. They should be careful not to remove them. Working in a downstream direction, the machine operator should toss the gravel to a depth of around half a metre and should never track back over the loosened material. Once these naturally calcified gravel beds are broken and tossed, fish will return to spawn. Once all in-stream work has been completed, a fencing program is normally the last step in any rehabilitation exercise. In channel sections where farm stock are likely to access the channel, it is absolutely essential that they be excluded. Whilst this is the simplest of enhancement exercises, it is without question the most important component of any enhancement program. Allow stock back into a channel after completing an in-stream work program and they will very quickly undo all of your good work. Livestock can also cause introduction of nutrient enrichment and of pathogens into the watercourse. But because we are fencing off stock, we have to allow them access to drinking water. The first preference is to keep the livestock fully out of the water by using a pumped water supply. But if this is not feasible, then use a cattle drink to stop the livestock going into the river. The fencing crew cannot visually appreciate the long-term benefits of their work as it takes a long time for nature to play catch-up. One year after fencing out stock, a variety of wild grasses will have recolonized the bank. Often, the root balls of trees like alders and willows, which were previously eaten or trampled by stock, will start to re-sprout. This fence has been in place for eight years, with very positive consequences. Even where banks are really badly trampled back to bare earth, this sort of recovery is possible without any reseeding in a five to ten year period, once stock are excluded. You can see the regeneration of several willow trees here in the left bank, and an alder tree in the right bank further downstream. Here's a similar circumstance at a different location. The alder tree in the foreground was self-seeding, and now it is eight years old, and is already two meters in height. A riparian zone of grass, shrubbery and trees along the banks of rivers and streams is a critical, multifunctional component of the ecology of a river corridor. It serves many purposes, including the provision of cover and shelter for large fish from predators, particularly when they are spawning in small streams. Shading, particularly in the smaller streams in summer drought conditions, creates a cooling effect which is necessary for young salmon and trout to survive. The shrubbery level along banks also helps to reduce the erosion level of silt from the banks. In the autumn, leaf litter falling into rivers is a major food source for aquatic invertebrates. It provides a habitat which supports the life cycle of numerous insect species. They in turn are a food source for fish, birds and bats. And of course shrubbery and trees are essential as nesting sites for an array of bird species as well as a feeding area for these animals. These banks have been badly damaged by allowing stock access to the channel. Unless repaired, they will result in a loss of pasture land and major ecological damage to the river. Some form of bank stabilization and revegetation is essential. In this relatively low gradient river, a log Christmas tree revetment option in combination with a stock proof fencing program will provide the most eco-friendly solution. This Christmas tree stabilization technique should only be used in moderate to low gradient channels which have a silty bed. The Christmas trees are nailed onto the forestry poles and each log is drilled into the locations to allow steel bars to be driven through each log to secure them to the river bed. The logs are then pinned end to end along the river bank with the Christmas trees providing a continuous line of cover. During this small summer flood event the impact of the revetment is self-evident. 
The treetops slow flows next to the bank, allowing suspended silt to deposit within and between the Christmas trees that are along the bank and eventually forming a berm. This technique will only work in channels with a silty bed for this reason. The berm quickly vegetates. The root mass of this vegetation stabilizes the toe of the bank. Seven years after placement of the revetment, the bank is unrecognizable. Stability is evident. The grasses are lining the banks. Willow trees have started to re-establish themselves. The conifer treetops have rotted at this point and they are no longer required for stability. This is the Castle Hill Stream, a tributary of Loch Kong County Mayo. This shot was taken 25 years ago and the extent of bank erosion because of stock access is quite obvious. A log Christmas tree revetment program was carried out here. The bank stabilized, revegetated, and now some 20 years later, that lush bankside vegetation has now been replaced by a continuous tree line. In high energy rivers, log Christmas tree bank protection is not a suitable option. In such rivers, the use of stone riprap may be the only alternative for bank stabilization. In recent years, localized intense rainstorms have caused major damage to rivers, even where banks have been protected and had a mature tree line. This, along with modifications on rivers, can lead to extreme bank erosion. The techniques already explored are preferable for restoring bank stability and combating erosion problems. However, in the few situations where these techniques aren't suitable, rock armor and stone erosion prevention can be used to stabilize banks through creating a riprap. Before we look at the reconstruction of this channel reach, it's worth noting a few do's and don'ts in relation to constructing riprap. Firstly, where riprap is being built along a high bank, there's no need to protect the entire bank face. Once the riprap is about 2.5 meters or so above bed level, you've reached an adequate height. Secondly, the bank should be sloped back at a 45 degree angle, otherwise you are inviting instability. Thirdly, and most importantly, the base rock should always be buried beneath the stream bed when you start the construction, otherwise you have no stable foundation. In this low bank situation, the riprap extends to the field level. It was placed here to prevent excessive erosion by the deflector and has done so successfully. Most of the riprap here on the D in County Louth is now cloaked in vegetation. The deflector is also silting up and vegetating. It will shortly become an extension to the right bank. The objective of an enhancement program should always be to restore the natural physical form of the channel as far as possible and allow the riparian zone to recover. This is an ongoing process that requires continual monitoring of the river's ecological system, fish stock, wildlife and vegetation. Monitoring includes electric fishing, red monitoring and monitoring of the bank vegetation, boulders and moss. Rivers are important. They are like arteries running through the Irish landscape, pulsing with life, streaming picturesque scenes and a connection with nature into nearly all our towns and villages. While sometimes we need to modify our rivers to help people with flooding and drainage, we have learned that we can also work with nature so that everyone wins. Well thought out river enhancement works will help give the river back many of its natural features and with this, nature will respond. More fish, more wildlife diversity and more natural bankside vegetation all bring the enhanced river one step closer to what it was originally.